The execution of Troy Davis in Georgia for the alleged murder of a police officer has a lot of people, both on and off of YouTube, talking about the death penalty. One person who weighed in on the topic recently was the always sagacious Prof. MTH, who was himself responding to a video by the plagiarist Antidote. Prof made several points in his video that I take no issue with. His critique of Christians who support the death penalty is absolutely worth the price of admission. But towards the end of his video, he made an argument that I do think deserves closer scrutiny than it has gotten both by proponents and opponents of the death penalty. It's called the argument for miscarriages of justice, though. Prof doesn't use that name. And it's an argument that I think is not only unpersuasive, if looked at in light of the facts, it paradoxically creates a strong argument in favor of the death penalty. To see why this is, let's take a look at the argument as presented by Prof. It's not often I agree with the Rutherford Institute, but I think they have it exactly right when they say the greatest argument against the death penalty is the errors and flaws in the criminal justice system. And that argument is incarnated in the 139 death row inmates who have been exonerated post-conviction by either DNA evidence or some other evidence since 1973. As of September 28th, 2011, 1,271 people have been executed in the United States since the death penalty was reinstated in 1976. In about the same time period, a number of people equal to almost 11% of that were found to have been wrongfully convicted of capital offenses and sentenced to death. 11%. I mean, it seems to me that that should give even the staunchest proponents of the death penalty reason to pause and reconsider their position. Now, of course, we can't know exactly how many people have been executed for crimes they did not commit. This is, in my opinion, a rather cogent argument, and one that no one concerned with the interest of justice can afford to simply dismiss out of hand. In fact, I'd like to do Prof. 1 better and provide an estimate of how many innocent people are executed in the United States every year. Samuel Gross and his colleagues in their paper, Exonerations in the United States, 1889 through 2003, identify four cases of posthumous exoneration in the years between 2000 and 2002. Let's assume for the sake of argument that this rate is representative. If so, that means the United States executes 1.3 innocent people every year. Now, even if that estimate is off, even if it's exaggerated, it still could be as reasonable to say that we execute maybe even as much as one person every three years. And I don't see how anyone can sort of look at that and see what an egregious rate of miscarriage of justice that is and not think that, geez, that might be a pretty good reason to abolish the death penalty. But before we actually decide to do that, we should take a closer look at the arguments and at responses to it. One objection comes from Ernest Vandenhoog, probably the greatest proponent of the death penalty in 20th century philosophy. Vandenhoog fully admits that miscarriages of justice will inevitably occur when we administer the death penalty. But the loss of innocent life is actually a price worth paying, according to him. To quote him directly, Nearly all human activities, such as trucking, lighting, or construction, cost the lives of some innocent bystanders. We do not give up these activities because the advantages, moral or material, outweigh the unintended losses. Analogously, for those who think the death penalty just, miscarriages of justice are offset by the moral benefits and the usefulness of doing justice. Now, whether or not you agree with Van den Hogg that there are moral and material benefits to having the death penalty is not the issue. That's not the point he's trying to establish here. The question is simply whether or not it's ever permissible to have a set of policies that we know will result in the death of innocent people. And the answer is pretty clearly yes. Now this might seem like a callous response, but Van den Hogg has a strong point. If we're really interested in saving innocent lives, there are much more effective things we can do other than eliminate the death penalty. About 36,000 innocent people die every year in the United States due to car accidents. That's about 10 9-11s every year. We could save nearly all of those people if we simply instituted and strongly enforced a national speed limit of 40 miles an hour. We 
as a society, have decided that these 36,000 lives are less important than our collective desire to get to work 15 minutes faster than we otherwise would. Given the lack of outcry that I've seen over the deaths of innocent people due to the high speed limit, I can't help but feel that there's a lack of consistency and possibly even a lack of sincerity when opponents of the death penalty hue and cry over the small handful of innocent people that are executed every year. But it actually gets worse than that. There are actually good reasons to think that abolishing the death penalty will increase miscarriages of justice. This is a highly paradoxical conclusion, but the heart of it can be found in this statement by Prof right here. Our criminal justice system is not infallible. It can't be. And because of the fallibility inherent in the system, it seems to me that society has no business imposing a penalty that does not admit of reversal. I mean, it's horrible enough when a person has spent years in prison, even on death row, for a crime he or she did not commit. But at least such a person can be exonerated, released from prison, and efforts can be made to make him or her whole to the extent possible. Society can do nothing for people it's executed for crimes they didn't commit. Nothing. It seems to me too great a risk to take with a fallible system. I'm afraid to say that while that sounds good, this line of reasoning actually ignores the relevant data on the issue. If you compare the rates of exoneration for people on death row with people serving life in prison, a different picture arises. According, again, to Samuel Gross and his colleagues, between the years of 1889 and 2001, there were 74 death row exonerations out of a total death row population of 3,577. This amounts to an exoneration rate of 2.07%. By contrast, there were 265 non-death row exonerations out of a total prison population of 1,404,032 inmates, or a mere 0.0188%. This suggests that wrongfully convicted people on death row are more than 100 times more likely to be exonerated than their non-death row equivalents. You can also look at how much attention gets paid to death penalty cases from the courts. As you can imagine, capital cases get a lot more oversight than otherwise equivalent non-capital cases. I'll spare you the exhaustive breakdown of the stats and just give you a few telling exemplars. According to the report on costs and recommendation for the control of costs of the Defender Services Program, federal death penalty cases consumed almost 6% of Defender Services costs in 1997, although they comprised approximately 0.3% of the caseload. In terms of defense attorney hours billed, the average number in non-capital homicide cases from 1992 to 1997 was 117 hours. The average number of hours billed in capital cases is 1,464 hours, more than an order of magnitude greater. That's 1,347 hours of surplus oversight for a death penalty case over an otherwise similar non-death penalty case, just from defense attorneys alone. These figures represent a considerably large amount of surplus oversight, and it is hard to believe that this extra attention does not considerably increase the likelihood of exoneration for innocent people. And this is not merely statistical speculation either. There are actual concrete cases where we can say with some confidence that innocent people were exonerated only because the death penalty was a factor. Quoting Gross again, In 1999, Dennis Fritz was exonerated by DNA evidence and released from a life sentence for a rape murder he did not commit. But he was exonerated as a byproduct of an intensive investigation that led to the exoneration of his co-defendant, Ron Williamson, who had been sentenced to death. If Williamson had not been sentenced to death, Fritz would probably be in prison to this day. The truth of the matter is, if an innocent person is sentenced to life in prison, it is almost guaranteed that they will die in prison. In this respect, innocent or not, for all intents and purposes, a life sentence is a death sentence. The alternative to being executed for a crime you didn't commit is being sentenced to life for a crime you didn't commit, and then dying anyway. Your odds of exoneration drop precipitously when you get a life sentence rather than a death sentence. Ironically, if you are an innocent person and you want to maximize your chances of being exonerated, then you should hope for a death sentence. 
But fear not if you are sentenced to death, because the odds of you actually being executed, even if sentenced to die, are remarkably small. As Brian Palmer recently stated in Slate, in the 33 years since California reinstated the death penalty, 78 of the state's death row inmates have died by natural causes, suicide, accident, or violence. Only 14 have been executed. This is despite the fact that California has the largest death row population in the country. In 2011 alone, approximately 721 people are awaiting execution in the state of California. As California Supreme Court Justice Ronald George put the point, the leading cause of death on death row is old age. Similar analysis is hold true for other states, even Texas, the death row capital of the United States. In 2010, Texas executed 17 people out of 321 on death row. At this rate, that means that someone on death row in Texas at a given year stands about a 5% chance of actually being executed. The odds are much, much lower in every other state in the Union. In fact, being on death row may actually increase your life expectancy, since everyone on death row gets their own cell, making it much less likely that you will die due to violence from other prisoners. So while a life sentence is, for all intents and purposes, a death sentence, oddly enough, the reverse is also true. For all practical purposes, a death sentence is merely a life sentence. So to summarize, the number of innocent people killed by the death penalty is paltry in comparison to the number of innocent people killed by society other ways for much more trivial reasons. There is good reason to think that the death penalty actually increases exoneration rates, and thus abolishing it would lead to more innocent people spending the rest of their lives in prison. If you are sentenced to life, then it is all but guaranteed that you will die in prison. A death sentence, by contrast, substantially increases your chances at exoneration, while only marginally increases your chances of dying, making a life sentence, practically speaking, a death sentence, and a death sentence, practically speaking, a life sentence. In closing, I want to be clear. I am not saying I support the death penalty. There are major problems with capital punishment. Among them, the bloated cost of the system, the flagrant and unapologetically racist manner in which it's applied, and the inherently cruel and callous nature of ritualistically strapping a defenseless person to a gurney against their will and deliberately poisoning them with the sole intention of ending their life. But while there are good arguments against the death penalty, the argument for miscarriages of justice is simply not one of them. And the mercy seems a burning, and I think my head is throwing, and in the way I'm hoping to be done with all this wind of the truth.